today. We're going to hear Scott Vance talk about his excavations on Turret 3A. Scott has worked in commercial archaeology for the past 17 years. He's currently a project manager with Pre-Construct Archaeology and his research interests centre on the late Iron Age and Roman periods within Northern England. Scott. Hello everyone, thanks for inviting me here today. I'm going to be talking to you all about a site PCA excavated in 2021, where we uncovered the remains of Turret 3A of Hadrian's Wall, which you can just see in the foregrounds here. So of course, you'll all be familiar with Hadrian's Wall. It's a World Heritage Site that runs for 73 miles from Bonus on Solway in Cumbria to Wall's End in North Tyneside. It was built in approximately 122 AD, took at least six years to build, and the frontier comprised the wall with its many turrets, mile castles and forts. There's a ditch to the north and also the earthwork to the south of Vallon, but that doesn't continue past Newcastle. So as part of a planning application in 2015 for student housing, an evaluation was undertaken at the site that found Hadrian's wall within two of their trenches. So because of this, Tyne and Weir archeology span service requested further work on the site in the form of an excavation. So this is when my company, PCA, got commissioned to do the work. Uh, so under the guidance of Historic England, PCA were tasked with exposing the line of the wall. So we'd clean it, map it and photograph it, but we weren't allowed to excavate any of it because where we found the wall, the development was going to be redesigned so it's preserved in situ. Excavation was limited to any berm obstacle pits and the northern ditch. So here's northeast England, Newcastle. We're all sat down here tonight. And the grey line is the line of Hadrian's Wall. And the site is approximately one kilometre east of Newcastle city centre. And here is the site itself. So we're on top of the western side of the Usburn Valley. The use burn down here. So you've got Stepney Bank to the north, Crow Hill Road to the west, and Coquit Street to the south. So unfortunately, no remains of Hadrian's Wall have been found in the valley itself. You do have the postulated location of Mile Castle 3 on top of the eastern side of the valley. And then to the west of the site, you've got a few areas at St. Dominic's Priory and Red Barns Housing Estate. And then we found the turrets just down here. So not exactly on the top of the hill, it's been moved slightly down a bit. So the measured location for turret 3A is, was meant to be 300 meters to the southwest of the site around Melbourne Street, where Durham University found remains of the wall in the early 2000s. So this is the site itself. So this was previously the location of the Norris House, which is a 20th century warehouse just opposite the Tanners pub. So the area around Newcastle includes the largest stretch of unlocated remains of Hadrian's Wall across the whole frontier. And previously, no reliable remains of any turrets have been found east of turret 7B. There is turret 0B that was found at St. Francis, but this was found by workmen in 1886 who were building a house, so it wasn't archaeologically excavated. And since its discovery, has been attributed to both a mile castle and a turret. But most archaeologists are in agreement now that the description better fits a turret. So what do we know of the course of Hadrian's Wall within the vicinity of the Usburn Valley? So this really good image is from William Stuckley's Itinerarium Curiosum. So the image and the accounts in the book were from 1725, but the book wasn't published until 1776. And this is the view westwards from Biker Mill Hill, where you can see the line of the wall still survived in 1725. You've got the Northern Ditch, you've got Newcastle in the distance, Benwell Hill, and then Shields Road and Biker Bank. And this is the Usburn Valley just in the distance. So unfortunately, there's nothing shown on the site I was excavating, but it does show the fort above Oosburn, which is this little structure here. So in the spacing scheme, this would make it Mile Castle 3. So in the book, 
He writes, I pursued the Pick's Wall beyond Pandon Gate to Biker Mill Hill. It passes a very deep valley at Oosburn, so ascends the opposite hill very steep, a rivulet running now in the ditch. Having mounted the hill, there's a square fort left upon the wall. Some of the foundation of the wall of the fort and of the Pick's Wall itself is visible. So several other antiquarians also cover the area, luckily. So I'm going to quickly summarise these rather than be, read them verbatim, you'll be happy to hear. So starting with John Horsley in 1732, he states that there is the visible foundation of a castellan, which is a mile castle, at the top of the eastern side of the valley. So that would be mile castle three again. He also mentions several ruinous heaps of stone, which are attributed to turrets, and that the line of the wall passed through the grounds of the house at Red Barns, which is at the top of Stepney Bank on the western side of the valley. So Red Barns appears a few times in antiquarian accounts. It used to be an old house and gardens just opposite the side to the west. <clears throat> he also mentions that the northern ditch is still visible. So John Brand in 1789 also corroborates the position of Mile Castle 3, recalls seeing stones taken from the structure to build an adjoining house. The ditch can still be seen, which is described as very deep with many square stones observed along the western slope of the valley that he attributes to robbed out stonework from the wall. And then the condition of Hadrian's wall had further deteriorated by 1801, when John Skinner records that from Biker Hill to the entrance of Newcastle, no remains of the wall could be seen and that people were actively employed in digging up the foundations to improve the ground. So in the same year, William Hutton records that part of the ditch had been leveled and converted into a bed of potatoes. The proprietors will allow gratis, he states, during three years to anyone who will level and improve the ground. And then 50 years later, John Collingwood Bruce states that nearly all traces of the wall are destroyed between Biker and Newcastle. And then he also reiterates the location of Mile Castle 3 because he found two large work stones that he was convinced formed part of the gateway to the Mile Castle. And then in the first edition of the Handbook to the Roman Wall in 1863, he adds that in the vicinity around Red Barns were heaps of loose stone that had been taken from Hadrian's Wall as coarse Roman mortar could still be seen on the blocks. And depressingly, he also adds that if the pilgrim can detect any trace of the wall or foss, which is the northern ditch, on either of the banks of the Usburn Valley, he will be fortunate. So what have archaeologists actually found in and around the valley? Well, not much. There's been 26 investigations within the valley itself. So the extrapolated line of the wall is shown in green. So out of the 26 investigations in the valley, none have found any structural remains, and all but two, sorry, two, have only found the upper fill of the northern ditch. So if you move to the eastern side of the valley, tiny weir museums have excavated several sites along the course of Shields Road and found both Hadrian's Wall, the northern ditch, and Kippy Pits, the closest of which is where the Greggs is on Shields Road opposite the Morrisons, and that's where you can see the line of Hadrian's Wall. They found the wall in 2002 to 2007 and a whole array of kippy pits. So we move on to the Mile Castle 3. So again, we have the antiquarian accounts, which several of them state it is located on the eastern side of the valley. You've got the two large stones that Bruce found, saying it was from the entrance gateway. And there was also a small altar found there in 1848. However, there's been several investigations on the site and none have actually found any structural remains. In fact, one of them notes that there's as much as three and a half meters of made ground on the site, showing there's been a lot of tipping activity on the eastern side of the valley. So if we move to the western side of the valley, we have George Spain's excavation in 1928. So that's at St. Dominic's Priory. So this is the image of the prior and two of the reverends standing on the wall of his trench. So this image was from 
Oops. There we go. From the time of the excavation and actually appeared in the Newcastle Journal and North Star on October 8th, 1928. And then if we go slightly to the east, Julian Bennett in 1981 also found Hadrian's Wall in two of his trenches. So the wall is actually slightly to the north of where it's been marked out on the cobbles. The next one is a bit famous five because a schoolboy found a Roman Samian bowl at an ice cream works in the 1950s, which is a weird account. That's just opposite the site of Stepney Bank. And then on our site, which is shown in the dashed red, George Spain also put a trench across that one. He found the Northern ditch, but failed to find any remains of Hadrian's wall itself. And then as part of this planning application, a desk-based assessment and evaluation were undertaken that did find the remains of Hadrian's wall on the site. So here's NA's 2015 evaluation. So they did a really good job of this because they had to trench the site while the building was still standing. So they had to work under artificial light, which I can imagine would be a nightmare. So they found Hadrian's Wall in their eastern trench. They had one berm obstacle pit. They exposed the ditch in the top three trenches. But again, they couldn't get to the base of it due to health and safety constraints. So they couldn't widen the trench to get near the foundation. So they were limited on how far they could actually dig. And then in the other trench, they had a rubber cut and a pile of collapsed stone from the wall as well. So finds were rather sparse on the site. With only one spindle world, which had been refashioned from Roman Samian pottery. So this had been made from central Gaulish ware. So that dates from the middle of the first, the end of the second century. But of course, you can't rely on the spot date because it's been refashioned into another object. But it has been noted that the reuse of Samian pottery to make spindle wheels is primarily a late Roman phenomenon. Not always, but primarily. So this is the 2021 excavation. So this, the east-west east -west axis. So this is where we just had to expose the line of Hadrian's Wall. So again, we couldn't do any excavation. It was just cleaning, photography, and then mapping where the structure was. Excavation was limited to any berm obstacle pits and the northern ditch to get any samples. So this red area is the east-west access of our trench. And this is what greeted us on the first day. So this is the crushed up remains of Norris House left over by the demolition team and its discovery, uh, not sure if it was followed by a quick stream of expletives, but it did prove useful later on for taking over the photos of the site. You can actually really appreciate the scale of this mound here. So ultimately this limited the scope of the work. So when we found the turrets, we couldn't actually expose the Southern limits because of this spoil mound. So we were kind of, and limited in how far to the south we could take it due to health and safety constraints, unfortunately. Um, but it was agreed with Historic England that there'd be a larger archaeological exclusion zone around this. So as turrets are roughly square in plan, we use the east-west dimensions to work out the north-south dimensions, and then there's a larger exclusion zone around that. So it'll still be preserved any potential remains that do survive along the southern wall. So as we have limited time, I'll just skim through some of the later remains. So we uncovered Red Barn's sawmill. This was built in the 1890s and further expanded in the early 20th century. So this occupied the majority of the central and western part of the site. So this is likely why George Spain didn't find any remains of Hadrian's Wall when he was trenching the western area. Because it's got several deep foundations cut into the natural, as well as large machine bases. Below that, we encountered medieval developed soil. So that contained a small assemblage of pottery dated to the 13th to 14th centuries. 
Uh, we even found a medieval jug handle on the first day lying on top of the site. So there was obviously lots of medieval activity in the area. Uh, in the distance, you can see my colleague re-excavating NAA's trench. And you can just see a few of the stones of Hadrian's wall poking out through the deposit. So at this point, we knew we had the line of the wall, but we had no idea we'd actually expose the turret. So after a few days of cleaning, we had this. So this is the northern wall of the turret, heavily disturbed. There was no surviving internal floor level. We've got the western and eastern walls continuing under the spoil mound, and it also continues to the east down into the Usburn. And then, of course, six berm obstacle pits at the front. So there are at least 160 turrets along Hadrian's Wall. That includes the early example at Pike Hill that predates the wall, as well as Peel Gap Tower. That's a later observation tower that appears between turrets 39A and B. However, only 57, including this one, have been archaeologically investigated. The numbering system was created by Robin George Collingwood in the 1930s, or actually 1930 was created. Um, and this goes from east to west, from Wall's End all the way to Bonus on Solway. So you have two turrets between each mile castle, labeled A or B, and they're labeled after the mile castle to the east. So this is the first one in the sequence, and the closest mile castle would be mile castle three, making this turret 3A. And this was originally thought to be 300 meters to the southwest of the site on the Melbourne Street area. So this slide shows all remains uncovered on the site. So geological deposits were exposed across the entirety of the trench. They were firm clays around the turrets that quickly changed to softer deposits of sand to the west and the north. Cut into that with the different elements of Hadrian's Wall. So we have the turret, the berm obstacle pits, and the northern ditch. So we've extrapolated the line of the wall to the east. That's just following on the same alignment as the turret because we have nothing to adjoin it with in the valley itself. And then to the west, it kind of kinks out to join the section over the road at Red Barn Sawmill and St. Dominic's Priory. And then as I was saying before, as turrets are roughly square in plan, we've used the east-west dimension to work out the north-south dimension. And then there's going to be a larger exclusion zone around that just to protect any remains we didn't excavate during the works. And then you also have post-medieval remains in purple. So there was a large pit truncating the turret. That contains 19th century material, a lot of pottery wasters from the local potteries in the Usburn Valley. We had the Keeler marmalade jars that were made in the mailings work, and also Newcastle pottery to the west of the city. Uh, we also have a mine shaft, a little well, and then the majority of this is Red Barn Sawmill. And then you also had the concrete foundations of Norris House, which crisscrossed the site. So before I start picking apart the different elements we found, I'm just going to give you a bit of background into turrets for those of you who aren't familiar with Hadrian's Wall. So <laughs> turrets functioned as observation towers. There was two located between each mile castle. They were spaced at just under 500 meters apart, which is very close to the maximum distance where you can recognize military uniform and therefore friend or foe. In plan, they're on average 5.8 meters squared externally and around 3.9 meters squared internally. There's unfortunately no archaeological evidence for the height of them, but we do think the observation tower was somewhere between seven and a half to nine meters above ground level, which would have been an easy feat to achieve by Roman engineering standards. And then this slide shows three of several possible reconstructions of turrets. So these were sent to me by Michael J. Moore and David Breeze. So the first one shows a flat roof crenellated with a wall walk. The second one has a wooden shingle roof with observation platform and wall walk. And the third one has a tiled roof observation platform, but no wall walk. So there are contemporary examples of turrets shown on Trajan's column. So this is a photo of one here. 
So Trajan's column was built in 113 AD, Hadrian's Wall around 122 AD. And this shows a window, observation platform, and a thatch group. So it's also possible they may have used thatch. There are slight differences in turrets that range from the thickness of their walls, the location of the door, and the type of threshold used. So these are normally attributed to the different legionary builders. So based on that, there's three types. You have broader walls with an eastern door, narrower walls with an eastern door, and narrow walls with a western door. And then depending where the door is, you have an internal stone platform inside the turret on the opposite side. So if you have the door on the eastern side, it's in the southwest corner. And if it's on the western side, it's on the southeast corner. So we don't actually know the function of these little platforms, but one did survive in turrets 18A to a height of around one meter. So it has been suggested these may have been platforms for stairs up to upper levels. And then this just shows three different types of turrets within wall mile sector 7 to 22. So the floors were normally of clay that were usually replaced with flagstones later on. Straws being found in overlying the floor at turret 51B. And then the northern wall of turrets is recessed. So it's slightly narrower than the thickness of the curtain wall. And then when turrets were abandoned, this recess was usually infilled. So how turrets are bonded to the curtain wall can also indicate when in the building program they were constructed. So turrets and mile castles feature wing walls on the eastern and western side of the northern wall for bonding with the curtain wall. So the curtain walls is the main element of Hadrian's wall. So turret 7B here, this was built early in the building program. So it was bonded with broad wall. So the wing walls aren't visible because the exterior face is flush with the curtain wall. However, when it was decided to reduce the thickness of the wall from 10 Roman feet to eight Roman feet, this created a point of reduction. So you'd have the narrow wall bonding with the turret, but this would expose a certain amount of the lower wing wall. So a good example of this is turret 26B. So this was constructed during the decision to actually reduce the wall. So the western side of the structure is bonded with broad wall. However, the eastern side is bonded with narrow wall. So this creates a point of reduction only on the eastern side, which you can see here in the plan. And then here you can just see the exposed foundation of the wing wall. And then there's the narrow wall bonding to the eastern side of the turret. So another good example is turret 29A. That's black cart. So this was built during the broad wall phase, but it's been bonded with narrow wall on either side. So that's got points of reduction at either side of the turret. It gets complicated when you have turret 45A, which doesn't have wing walls. So this is actually an early turret that was built before Hadrian's wall was. So you can see the narrow wall actually abuts the structure. So this was likely a observation tower for the stain gate system to the south. So the stain gate is the Roman road to the south. That's the medieval name. And there was troops stationed along its length. So that was likely an observation tower for the troops along the stain, uh, yeah, the stain gate. And then when Hadrian's wall was built, it was then subsumed into the wall. You have the unusual example at Muckle Bank, which is turret 44B. So this was built later in the building program. So there's no point of reduction as it's bonded with narrow wall. It's unusual because it's been built within the corner of the wall. So it's recessed into both the Western and Northern walls. And then the last turret to be discovered was by Jim Crow in 1987 which was a Peel Gap. So there's Peel Gap Tower. That's built abutting the narrow wall, which is in turn built upon broad wall foundations. And this actually appears between turrets 39A and B. So they think this turret was built to cover a blind spot within Peel Gap, as this couldn't be seen from turrets 39A to the east or 39B to the west. 
So we've got turret 39A over this ridge. There's the turret in the foreground. And then to the west, you've got turret 39B just by those trees, which is Steel Rig Car Park. This turret seemed a temporary measure as it didn't last long. It was demolished by the Romans when the wall was rebuilt with hard mortar. And pottery dating to the demolition layers only date to about 180 to 220 AD. Pits on the berm have been found on several sites east of turret 11B. So turret 11B is located between heading on the wall to the west and Throckley to the east. So these would have held sharpened branches that would have acted as entanglements. So Tynaway Museums, during their investigations at Throckley, found three kidney pits, which kind of turn inwards towards the wall. <clears throat> which has been suggested indicates that the berm narrows and the ditch converges towards turrets. So this is shown in Graham Hodgson's kind of reconstruction here. The turrets just cropped out of the image in the corner. We've got a wide berm that narrows towards the turrets. You have the ditch also converging towards the turret with no berm obstacle pits directly in front of the structure. So although no berm obstacle pits have been found west of Hedden, the ditch does converge on several turrets on the eastern sector of the turf wall and also converges slightly at turret 26B. Okay. It was also suggested on the site that the southern lip of the ditch had been remodeled at a later date. So they suggested that following the abandonment of the turrets, the ditch was remodeled, moved further to the north, creating a wider berm, and then new berm obstacle pits were installed directly in front of the turret. So this has led to it being, if a turret survived the length of Hadrian's Wall for the whole Roman period, you'd have no berm obstacle pits directly in front of it. But if it was abandoned, the southern lip of the ditch would be remodeled with berm obstacle pits put directly in front of it. However, this is only based on three kidney pits. So further work needs to be done as for <clears throat> long stretches of the visible ditch, the, it doesn't converge towards the wall. So to return back to turret 3A, so as I previously stated, the western side of the structure actually kinks out towards the parts found at Red Barnes and St. Dominic's Priory. So this rarely occurs at broad wall turrets, but occurs at nearly all narrow wall turrets within the central sector. And the reasoning for this has been suggested to improve sight lines up and down the wall. And then unfortunately, due to the scale of truncation, there's no visible recess in the turrets or wing walls, as these would have appeared higher up in the stonework. So we only had the foundations. So the wing walls would have only appeared higher up. And as it's a narrow wall turret bonded with narrow wall, there wouldn't have been a point of reduction there anyway. Um, we don't know the type of turret because we didn't excavate the southern part because of the spoil mound. So we don't know the type, unfortunately. Um, it does have broad walls, as you'll hear in a bit. So it could be the type of an eastern door, but then there's further works needed on this. So this slide shows the detailed plan of the structure. So mostly foundations. So this is all foundation material. There's no facing stones <clears throat> or surviving floor levels. We have a small area of wall core here and wall core in this top area. So NAA's trench was along here. We have a small deposit of collapsed material. And then there's several rubber trenches have actually been cut through the turret. So again, finds were sparse because of course we couldn't dig it. We did find one fragment of Roman tegula, which is a Roman roof tile, which would appear to suggest that the roof may have been tiled. However, in other turrets where these have been found, it's always in low quantities. Same with stone slates, where they've been found in turrets, it's always been in low quantities. So until we find a turret with a whole deposit of collapsed roof line, we don't actually know how it was roofed. So the northern wall that was exposed for 12 meters east-west continues to the east. 
That is narrow gauge wall, so that was 2.46 meters wide. <clears throat> we then have the side wall, so these were the same thickness nearly as the northern wall, which is quite rare. So these were about 2.4 meters wide. So the side walls of turrets range from about 0 0.91 to 2.23, with the average side walls of a turret being around 1.2 meters. So the side walls at turret 3A are actually twice the size of the normal wall. And then externally, turrets and plan were about 5.8 meters squared. Turret 3A is 10.26 meters squared. So it's almost twice the size of the average turret. So here's a couple of sections from the eastern side of the trench. This is where NAA's trench was. So we have the foundations, wall core above, that's wall core. And then you can see the collapsed stonework here. So this stone and this stone are the same one, which is looking to either side. So these two actually might be facing stones from the wall. So the foundations are partially exposed in the eval trench and found to be over 0 0.64 meters deep with wall core surviving to a maximum height of 0 0.58 meters. So the foundations of Hadrian's Wall, east of Newcastle, vary from the rest of it, as there's usually two foundation deposits in the Newcastle of Walls End sector. And in fact, there's three at Durham site on Melbourne Street. So it's been suggested that this represents an additional amendment to the scheme of building Hadrian's Wall. So as long with the narrowing of the wall, the plan also changed in the different foundation layers east of Newcastle. So you can see how disturbed these stones are here. This is the northern wall. So there's a robber cut along the length of this. There was another one on the western wall, and there was two on the eastern wall. And then you make out the 19th century pit in the corner there. It's kind of coming up in the section. So the next two slides are just to show you some examples of upstanding turrets, just to show you actually how large turret 3A is. So this is the lovely example, turret 7B at Denton. So turret 3A is at least 4.43 meters wider east-west externally, and 1.65 meters wider internally. So this means turret 3A has got substantially wider walls. Got the lovely example at turret 26B in Brunton. So again, this is the one with broad wall to the west and narrow wall to the east. Turret 3A was at least 4.67 meters wider externally and 1.93 meters wider internally. So previously, the largest known turret was at Melkridge, which is turret 40B. So this was demolished by the Romans. It was excavated in 1948, and they noted it was heavily truncated with only the eastern door jam remaining. So this is where turret 40B should be. So this turret is actually three centimeters wider internally than turret 3A. However, externally, turret 3A is over two meters wider, showing it's got substantially wider walls. So the unusually large size of this turret was attributed to the wide panoramic views. So in clear weather, you'd be able to see Mile Castle 30 to the east and Mile Castle 50 to the west. So this is the view from the turret. So excellent views to the west and Mile Castle 50, Great Chester's Roman Fort, as well as the next turret, which is turret 41A at Core Gap. Brilliant views to the north. got the site of turret 40B just in the foreground with turret 40A just on the ridge here. And then views of Mile Castle 30 to the east in clear weather. And then coming around to the south, you'll be able to see the Stangate Roman roads cutting across the fields. So signaling towards this Roman road would be incredibly important prior to the fort decision because all the forts would have been aligned along this road. We can just see cutting across the fields in the distance. You also have the Maidenway Roman Road in the valley over there, 
before returning to the east where you can see Mile Castle 50. Oops, skipped one now. So turret 3A was also sighted in a prominent position within the landscape. So this image was kindly produced by Eric Grafstahl using EU digital elevation model over Europe data. So this is the location of turret 3A. So on its measured location, it should be around here, 300 meters to the southwest, but it's been moved to the northeast. The likely reason for this is to enable greater sight lines up and down the Usburn Valley. So from this location, you can see up and down the valley, but also two navigable reaches of the River Tyne to the south. So this is when the spoil heap actually proved useful. So I'm standing at about seven and a half meters above ground level. You've got the foundations in the foreground, but excellent views to the northeast towards the valley. You would be able to see Mile Castle 3 to the east. You've got student housing blocking the view. But from the other side of the valley, with our sight in the distance, you've got brilliant views. So Eric also kindly undertook a view shed analysis from the turret. So for those of you not familiar with GIS, that's when you can set up a predefined location and you can work out what was in view of that structure. So in this case, it was turret 3A. He set the eyeball height to 7.6 meters above ground level. And then the area in green is everything you can actually see from the observation platform of turret 3A. So you'd be able to see turrets 2A and 2B to the east. Excellent views to the north, as well as the Usburn Valley. Views to the south over the River Tyne. And then of course you've got Ponze alias Roman Fort, Newcastle, Mile Castle 4, and then all wall installations up to perhaps turrets 5A or 5B. So the original plan for Hadrian's Wall was a system of mile castles and turrets built to standardized dimensions. And then these were linked either by a turf or a stone wall with the, uh, the forts and the vallum added at a later date. So where the wall was built in stone, its early sections took on broad form, <clears throat> although some portions were later amended to a narrow design. So the section east of Newcastle is all narrow gauge wall. So the variation in construction of turrets along the wall represents another amendment to the original scheme. So along with narrowing the wall, there's also the amendment of allowing non-standardized dimensions for turrets and also moving them out of their measured location. So in the case of turret 3A, this meant moving it from 300 meters to the southwest to the top of the Usburn Valley, enabling better sight lines to monitor movement up and down the valley. Uh, local conditions such as geology and topography may also have influenced the size and sighting of turrets. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned before, around the turret, it was all firm deposits of clay. However, slightly to the west, it turned to softer deposits of sand. So the legionary construction teams likely knew the presence of these deposits, either when excavating the northern ditch or when quarrying the raw materials for the construction of the wall. So they've likely mitigated the risk of collapse by digging wider and deeper foundations. So no other structural remains survived of the wall west of the turret. Unsurprising, as this is where you get the softer deposits of sand. <clears throat> also, you had the truncation in the 19th century with the construction of Red Barn Sawmill. So the burn at the Norris House site was 10 meters wide. On average, this is normally six meters wide but variances are known in the turf wall sector, so it's likely that this continued in the stone wall sector as well. Interestingly, there's berm obstacle pits directly in front of the turrets, 
and the ditch doesn't converge towards it. It actually goes out of the site and goes below Stepney Bank. So it has been suggested that pits directly in front of the turret and a remodeled ditch would suggest it was abandoned early on. However, there's no indication of this at the turret 3A site. So it's likely the berm was always wide originally. So here are the six berm obstacle pits, my colleague excavating one of them. So six survived. They were oval in plan with maximum dimensions of 0 0.92 by 0 0.84 and up to about 17 centimeters deep. Fortunately, the fills were sterile. We had nothing to firmly date them and there was no preservation of any wood from any entanglements. However, their form and plan and location directly in front of the structure indicates that they were berm obstacle pits. So there are several types of defensive pits on Roman frontiers. There are the kippy pits, which are the entanglements of intertwined arrays of branches. You have the lilia, which are entrapment pits with sharpened stakes at the bottom. You also have the open pits, which are just large pits to slow down attackers. And then you also have flecked verxan, which are irregular patterns of post holes with discontinuous lengths of fencing. And they're found on the ration limes in Germany. So because of the size of these, we don't think they're open pits, much too small. So we likely think they are kidney pits, which is the same conclusion reached by the archaeologists at Tiny Weir Museums when they were excavating along Shields Road. So moving on to the ditch, this was exposed in the northwest corner of the site. It was a sizable feature measuring over eight meters wide. It's just over two meters deep and preservation of environmental remains was excellent because of a natural spring just to the west of the site. It's also meant that digging it was a right pig. So here you can actually appreciate the scale of the ditch here. So both my colleagues are about six foot tall. You've got the ditch coming down here and then going up here so it's an absolutely massive feature so we recorded this section and we think only the lower 0 0.6 meters of deposits are actually contemporary with the wall so we have no firm dating evidence again unfortunately but because it represents the initial natural silting it's likely contemporary <clears throat> although it should be kept in mind as because this was a maintained feature, there'd be several cleaning episodes. So there's likely been a lot of information lost when it was maintained over the years. So environmental samples revealed that the edges of the ditch were initially colonized by annual herbaceous plants, which favored insects like the caddisfly. However, secondary fill of the ditch showed a change to an environment dominated by rush seeds, but without the insects. And then this then it reverts to the original environments again, to one that was more persistently damp without the standing water. So luckily, Donna Mira is present tonight, kindly had a look at these samples. And he suggested that this may represent a period when the ditch was infilled with material, creating a stagnant environment conductive to rushes, but not one with standing water, which would allow either the breeding of caddis flies or the buildup of deposits containing insect remains. So speculatively, he suggests this may represent the period between 142 to 162 AD, when the frontier moved to the north, when everyone went to the Antonine Wall, with a cleaning episode largely removing the infill and allowing the resumption of an open standing water environment. So again, the source of the water would be the natural spring to the west of the site. So the top 1.82 meters of the ditch's fill dates to the post-medieval period. So it's clear the feature remained open for a considerable period of time. And if you see the ditch in the central sector, it's still open as well as at 26B. Finds assemblage from the deposit suggests a 19th century date for the majority of the infilling, which would kind of correspond to the antiquarian accounts where people were actively employed to infill the ditch to improve the ground. And then the uppermost deposits in gray, that's all modern material from the construction and demolition of the sawmill 
and the construction and demolition of Norris House. So the discovery of Turret 3A at the top of the Usburn Valley has provided new insights into the construction of Hadrian's Wall and its installations. It indicates that local factors influence the positioning of structures along the wall and that strategic interests outweigh the original spacing scheme. The turret is the largest yet discovered with its substantial size, perhaps linked to the wide panoramic views because it's been moved again to the Usburn Valley. So you can see the valley and the River Tyne to the south. So turrets are known to vary in size, especially in the central sector. And it is possible that along with placing of forts on the wall and the narrowing of the wall, <clears throat> there was another amendment in the form of having non-standardized dimensions of turrets. So at least two levels of foundations are noted in the Newcastle to Walls End section of Hadrian's Wall. That indicates a variation from the earlier norm. And it's possible that the size of turrets followed suit. And then unfortunately, because we couldn't dig the structure, because it's all going to be preserved below the development, we didn't get any finds to actually suggest when it was abandoned. So if you can rely on the late Roman date for the Samian spindle world found during the 2015 evaluation, which you can't really, because it's from the collapse material, uh, but if you did, it would place turret 3A with others such as turrets 40, 44B at Mucklebank and turret 7B at Denton that continued past the late second century because they occupied kind of important strategic locations. So PCA's investigation has shown that significant remains relating to Hadrian's War can and do survive within the more built up areas of urban Tyneside. I'd quickly like to thank a few people before the questions. Um, so Property Design Associates and the Cassidy Group, they've generously funded the work and they've been great from the get go while doing this. Uh, special thanks to David Breeze and Michael J. Moore for providing the images of the turrets and letting me use them, especially for David Breeze for sending me several plans of the turrets and a load of information. And of course, Jonathan McKelvey for giving me permission to use the images of the excavation on Shields Road. So the site will be published in an upcoming edition of AA, but as it's still going through planning, I don't know when that will be. Uh, but an article did appear in Current Archaeology, issue 400, for whoever's interested. So that is available online, or feel free to email you, me, and I'll send you a PDF copy if anyone is interested. And of course, I'd like to thank you all for listening tonight.